Yeah. Well, uh, God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Uh, how many of you remembered luncheon today? Uh, we're going to have lunch after service. Hopefully, uh, we'll trust that, that there's enough food and, and there's great people of faith to multiply the food if needed in, in here this morning. Amen? Amen. <laughs> uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, take your Bibles and uh, we're going to uh, finish chapter 4 uh, this morning. We're going to begin at verse 12. And the last time we were together, we covered verses 7 to 11. And uh, the message was on uh, what we need to do because the end is near. Peter said in verse 7, have a look, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be clear-minded and self-controlled so that you can pray. And so because the end is near, we learn, first of all, that it's time to pray. When God's people pray, God moves. Amen? Amen? When His people pray, God moves. And He answers us when we call upon His name. We learn that we need to walk in love and forgiveness. Verse 8, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Thirdly, we learn that we need to enjoy the fellowship of the believers. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. And that word hospitality, what that means to be fond of company. To enjoy being with one another is what Peter is talking about. And then lastly, we learn because the end is near number four, we are to serve one another using the gifts that God has given us. Verse 10, each one should use whatever gift he has received to serve others, faithfully administering God's grace in its various forms. My message this morning is entitled, uh, Painful Trials. So if you're taking notes, no notes this morning on the screen, you're going to have to do it the old-fashioned way and listen. How many of you are up for that? All right. Painful Trials is the title of the message this morning. Will you stand for the reading of God's Word? We're going to look at verses 12 to... 19, the end of chapter 4, this morning. And hear the word of the Lord. Verse 12, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ, so that you may be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed, for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. If you suffer, it should not, say that, it should not. It should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. For it is time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, what will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if it is hard for the righteous to be saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. Father, this is your word, and we thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for this opportunity, me to preach this message, for my friends to hear this message. And I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be pleasing to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. And I pray that you would give us all ears to hear what the Holy Spirit would say to us as your church this morning. In Jesus' name and all of God's children said Amen. Amen. God bless you. You can be seated. Verse 12, just keep your Bibles open. We're just going to go through some of these verses together. And Verse 12, in my opinion, is one of the most important verses in the New Testament. One of the most important verses in the New Testament. Especially when you consider the context of uh, our culture, Canadian or North American culture. Verse 12 is very, very important. It says, Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Now, 
The reason I believe this is so important is because it brings balance to a much unbalanced uh, theology in the North American church where a vast majority of the most popular ministries in the North American church today are ministries which proclaim what is called the prosperity gospel. And there's nothing wrong with the prosperity gospel in that it teaches that God wants all of his children to be blessed, all of his children to be highly favored, all of his children to be the head and not the tail, etc., etc. It's not that the prosperity gospel is wrong, it's just that it's out of balance a little bit. And it tends to ignore verses of Scripture and passages of Scripture that talk about times when believers will go through times that are difficult. How many of you have had painful trials in your life as a believer? And while it is true that God does want to bless us and He wants us to be highly favored and all of those things that the prosperity gospel will preach, and He wants us to prosper financially too, He, he does want to bless us. What we have to understand is that there are times, according to the Word of God, when we will go through very difficult, very painful things, very uh, difficult, heart-wrenching things as believers. And that being blessed by God does not mean being immune to going through difficulties in life. I want you to just take a listen here. Uh, if you want, you can turn Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. Paul says something to the Philippian church that kind of turns the prosperity gospel uh, upside down a little bit because Paul is, is proclaiming to them how he had learned to live through life through the ups and through the downs of walking with the Lord. I mean, you know there's ups and there's downs in life. There's ups and there's downs in our walk with the Lord as well. And, and I don't want you to miss what Paul is saying in this passage of Scripture, Philippians chapter 4. Verses 11 to 13, and I want you to listen to what Paul said. He said, I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned, Paul said, to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. Do you hear that? Paul wrote, I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. You say amen? Amen. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. And don't miss what Paul is saying. And... and if he had to learn the secret of being content, he had to learn how to allow the strength of Christ to get him through a time when he was in want. He had to learn to rely on the strength of Christ to get him through times when he did not have plenty, but when he was actually hungry. And so Paul wasn't always prosperous in the sense of always having everything that he needed. He had to learn to rely on the strength of Jesus Christ to get him through circumstances in which he found himself in, in the ups and downs of life, when he had a need, when he was in need, when he was in want, when he was hungry and not well fed. He learned that he could go through every circumstance, no matter what was going on in his life, by the power of Christ who gave him strength. And so likewise, Peter in our verses this morning, assures us of this. Point number one of the message, all believers will go through trials. All believers will go through trials. The NIV calls them painful trials. The King James Version calls them fiery trials. The word painful or the word fiery, it comes from a Greek word which means to be ignited or literally to be burning, to be on fire. Um, and it is used in reference to uh, putting metals in, in, you know, and burning metals in order to purify the metal of its impurities, right? To be put through uh, the fire. The implication that Peter is saying is, is he is using this word is that God is purifying us in these trials as metals are purified by going through the fire. And this particular word that is used is only used in two other verses of scripture in Revelation chapter 18. And in Revelation chapter 18, 
The Bible talks about the mystery city of Babylon who, by God's judgment, would go through a, a severe judgment by God and the smoke of the city's burning or fiery trial or painful trial would rise up and would be evident to all. And the, the point of that passage is that God was going to purify that wicked city from their sins through his judgment. And so we have this word, we go through painful trials so that we will be purified, so that God will use that painful trial to purify our lives and, and get rid of the, the dross in, in the metal, so to speak. How many of you following what I'm saying here? So God uses painful trials. The trials, Peter says, are permitted by God to, to try you. To try you. Now the King James Version in verse 12. You got the King James Version here again this morning, Randy? New King James. Well, that might work. I want you to read... The NIV omits something here, and it's the purpose of the trial. The NIV, I'll read it, says, Dear friends, do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. Verse 12, Randy. Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened to you. So did you catch what was missing from the NIV? The fiery trial, which is to try you. And that's there in, in the Greek text. I don't know why the NIV omitted it, but it did. The fiery trial, which is to try you. And so the trials are allowed by and or are permitted by God in order to try you. The word try in this passage, it means this. It's a great, it's a great meaning. The Greek word means put to proof, putting to proof. And it, it basically... It basically means God is allowing things to happen, painful trials to happen in our life to prove who we are. Do we really love Him? Do we really uh, have a desire to stay faithful to Him? And the only time we can be tested in regards to our love for God and our faithfulness to God is through trial. It's through trial. When there's pressure upon our lives, you know, think of it like a sponge that's, uh, that's wet. When you squeeze it, you put pressure on it. What's inside is going to come out, right? And that's why God wants to use fiery trials. He wants to squeeze us. He wants to put us through intense moments so that we can see what we're truly made of. Sometimes the stuff that comes out of my life in pressure isn't very good. How many of you found that to be true? When pressure's on your life, sometimes... You know, what comes out just isn't very good. And that's the purpose of it, to purify you, to show you, to prove to you who you really are so that, that you can then turn to the Lord and be purified of the weaknesses that are revealed. James gives us this promise in his discourse on suffering in James chapter 1. James says, consider it pure joy whenever you go through trials of many kinds and and in verse 12, James said, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial, because when he has stood the test, and that word test is the same word that Peter uses in the King James Version, these trials which are to try you, when you have passed the test, or when you have stood the test, you will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So there is a purpose for the fiery trial and here's the purpose, and you can jot this down for your notes. The purpose of the fiery or the painful trial is to reveal something in us that needs to be refined. God wants to reveal something in you and I in a painful trial that needs to be refined. And another point that I want to make this morning about these painful trials uh, is this. Uh, based on, uh, again, verse 12, have a look. Uh, Peter says, Do not be surprised at the painful trial you are suffering, as though something strange were happening to you. And so the second point I want to make is a painful trial is normal. A painful trial is normal. It's normal for the Christian to go through painful and fiery trials. And so God is not necessarily mad at you. How many of you know when you go through something very difficult and the world around you is out of control and things are not going as you think they should be going, the first thing sometimes that I think is, God, what did I do? 
What do I need to do to get this all corrected? God's not necessarily mad at you when you go through a painful trial. It's normal. It's normal. Peter says, don't be surprised as if something strange was happening to you. And the word strange literally means to be foreign or a foreigner. And so trials should not be viewed as some foreign invader, but a regular part of life. And all you have to do is live life long enough to figure that out. Okay? That you will go through difficulties in life. That you will go through painful things in life. And God wants to use those things to reveal something in us that needs to be refined. And He's not necessarily angry with us. It's just normal. They're permitted by God. And then Peter goes on to say that we shouldn't have to suffer trial. He, he talks about basically the sources of suffering are revealed in, in the text here. It's very clear. So Peter says, if you have a look here in verse um, 14, if you are insulted because of the name of Christ, there will be times when people insult us, when people hate us. Jesus said was a time was coming when all nations will hate you because of me. How many of you have have been insulted or mistreated simply because you're a Christian. That's the only reason. It's happened to me before. It's happened to many of us, right? And so that's one source of suffering. It's just the mistreatment that comes because Jesus said, in this world you will have trouble. Uh, Jesus promised us that we would be hated by the world because of our relationship with Him. So this shouldn't surprise us. So one source of suffering is just because you're a Christian. Because you love Jesus. People are going to make fun of you. People are going to ridicule you. Some people are, abs are actually going to hate you. For no other reason than you're a Christian. But then Peter reveals a second source of suffering. One that he says, this should not be how you suffer. And verse 15, have a look at it. If you suffer, it should not be as a murderer or a thief or any other kind of criminal or even as a meddler. And so suffering that we go through is not supposed to be um, self-inflicted. It's not supposed to be because of our sinful choices. So that's a second source of suffering is our own sinful choices. When we choose to do that which God says is, uh, is evil, when we choose to sin, we will suffer the consequences of uh, for that. And so what Peter is saying is, if you suffer because you belong to Christ, rejoice in that because the glory of God rests on you, but you shouldn't suffer because of being evil, being a murderer, being a thief, being a, a meddler. His point is you shouldn't suffer because of your own sin. Now the truth is we will suffer because of our own sin. That's what that uh, reveals. And so our response to fiery trials in verse 13 is to rejoice. James in chapter 1 says uh, to rejoice. And, and the reason is uh, because we will be overjoyed when His glory is revealed. Now what does this mean? Rejoice when you suffer because you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when the glory of God is revealed. Let me explain to you how I, I best believe this, this phrase actually works. How many of you have heard of Stephen Curtis Chapman? Great Christian artist, my favorite Christian artist. And here is, I'm just going to share with you some lyrics from a song and, and a, some more words of Jesus that will kind of give meaning to our suffering uh, and meaning to the fact that the glory of God um, will be revealed and will be overjoyed when the glory of God is, is revealed. Stephen Curtis Chapman wrote a song a number of years ago uh, called Remember Your Chains. And in it he wrote this, listen to these words. There's no one more thankful to sit at the table than the one who best remembers hunger's pain. And no heart loves greater than the one that is able to recall the time when all it knew was shame. And the chorus says, remember your chains. Remember the prison that once held you before the love of God broke through. Remember the place you were without grace. And when you see where you are now, remember your chains. And remember your chains are gone. Isn't that great? You got to YouTube the song and listen to it. It's just, remember your chains, Stephen Curtis Chapman. It's an amazing, amazing song. 
And what is happening in this verse where Peter says, Rejoice that you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you'll be overjoyed when the glory of God is revealed. I think the same principle is found in Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Jesus is invited to the home of a Pharisee, and while he is reclining at the table having dinner with this Pharisee, a sinful woman from town comes in, and she begins to weep. And as she is weeping, she is weeping on Jesus' feet and then using her hair to wipe Jesus' feet off. And the Pharisee says, if Jesus, if he knew who this woman was, uh, he wouldn't let her touch him. And then Jesus goes on to share a little story. And at the end of the story, he says to the Pharisee, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. And Jesus is here saying that only those who understand how much they have been forgiven can have a greater love for God. I mean, you know that to be true. Your love for God will increase the more you understand how great your sin was that He forgave. It's the same with the glory of God. How many of you love to experience the glory of God's presence? When you come to Sunday, and there's just a sweet sense of God's presence as we worship. How many of you love that? It's, it's amazing. It's even more amazing for the person who has gone through suffering. The same principle is applied here, that when we go through suffering, we are more overjoyed when we experience the glory of God after going through a trial. And I have experienced this over and over in my life when I've went through a difficult time when God revealed His love and His glory and His presence. It was like, ah, oh, thank you, Lord, I needed that. I needed that. It was that much more greater and that much more joyous because of uh, the suffering. This is the reason why Paul wrote in Romans chapter 8, verse 18, I consider that our present suffering is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. And the glory will be that much greater after going through a painful trial than it would be without it. That's just the truth of the matter. And so Peter addresses, again, this issue of suffering because of our sinful choices. We can suffer because of our sinful choices. Verse 15. And here's what Peter is saying. If we are going to suffer, let it be for righteous reasons and not for unrighteous ones. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Let it be because you are a Christian, because you are doing what's right and other people are insulting you or saying evil against you because of your relationship with Christ. Don't let it be because of your unrighteous decisions or your sin. This is the reason why in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus taught us to pray the following, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. In other words, in our conversations with God in prayer, we are to and should consistently ask for His help to avoid temptation and evil and to direct our paths. As Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will direct your paths. When we pray, we want God to direct our paths. And when we pray, we want God to help us avoid areas of our lives that will bring temptation and possible evil so that we can make righteous choices all of the time. So we can suffer because of our faith in Christ, but we can also, Peter says, suffer because of our own sinful choices. How many of you have ever made a bad sinful decision that ended up hurting? Ended up causing a little bit of suffering for you. All of us have. All of us have. And there's a wonderful promise in, in the scriptures. Because implied in, implied in verse 15, if I can suffer for my own evil choices, the third source of suffering is implied there. I can also suffer because of other people's sinful choices that directly affect me. How many of you know that to be true? Suffering can come because of my relationship with Christ and my faith in Him. It can come because of my sinful choices that will affect me negatively. And it will come by the sinful choices of other people that affect me directly because of their sinful choices. And in, in those two cases, 
where my sin causes suffering or when the sins of other people who make decisions that affect me cause suffering, there's a great promise in the Bible, Romans 8, verse 28. And Paul said this, for those who are suffering because of their own choices or suffering because of the choices of others, and we know that in all things God works together for the good of those who love Him who have been called according to His purpose. Can you say amen? amen? He will work all things for His good. That's His promise. Now a caution is necessary here, okay? Because uh, the God who works all things together for good does not mean He endorses the things that prompt Him to work together for good. Do you know what I'm saying? He works all things together for good. It doesn't mean that the choices that were, that were made that cause God to say, I've got to take this situation and bring good of it, it doesn't mean that the choices were God's will. When I sin, I'll suffer for the, for the choices I make. When others sin against me, uh, I can suffer for the choices I make. But God promises that in those circumstances, to turn those things around and use them ultimately for His good, it doesn't mean that the choices were His will. Do you understand? We can't conclude that just because all things work together for good, that all things are God's will. No. What it does mean is that we serve an amazingly good Father who will use every circumstance in our lives and work for our good because He is good. Can you say amen? Amen. Okay. And so then Peter affirms what he has already proclaimed, verse 16, now that uh, if we suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God for that name. But then he shares some principles to close the chapter, and we're coming to the close here in just a second. Uh, the third point I want to make uh, this morning, based on verses 17 to 19, is this. And this is so important. You'll see why in the text. Uh, the point being this. Believers in Jesus Christ need to set an example of faithfulness to God. Every human being, unbeliever and believer alike, goes through painful trials. It's the believer that needs to set the example of how to go through those trials with God. We need to set an example of faithfulness to God. Look at verses 17 to 19. It's interesting. He says, it's time for judgment to begin with the family of God. And if it begins with us, look at this, what he says. What will the outcome be for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And look at verse 18. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? So what's on Peter's heart here? He repeats it twice in two verses. What's the outcome going to be for the sinner? And so Peter is addressing this issue and he is saying when you go through suffering... You need to be faithful to God through your suffering. Look at verse 19. If you suffer according to God's will, or you can just say if you suffer at all, uh, we should commit ourselves to our faithful creator and continue to do good. That's the example that we need to set. That when we suffer, we just continue to do what we know is good. Why? Verse 18. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, what will we become? What will become of the ungodly? Uh, and the sinner. If it's hard for the righteous to be saved, if, it's, if the painful trials cause the righteous to question the goodness of God, if the painful trials cause the Christian to question and doubt the character of, of God's goodness and His love, and, and we do in those times, if we do not remain faithful to our Creator during those times, what will become of the ungodly when they go through a painful trial? if they see that we can't go through it with God. That's Peter's point. We need to set an example of faithfulness to God. That when we go through a trial, a person who knows us, an unbeliever who looks at our lives can say, I cannot believe you still choose to go to church. I cannot believe you still choose to read your Bible. And I cannot believe you still choose to serve God after all that has happened to you. And you could say, well, I am because he is good. And everyone goes through painful trials. And what's on Peter's heart needs to be on all of our hearts. It's the, it's the condition of a lost soul. What will become of the ungodly and the sinner? If we do not set an example of how to walk through painful trials and stay faithful to God 
and stay faithful to the message that He is good and that we're going to continue to do what is good despite the negative circumstances that we are, are going through, then how is it possible for an ungodly person to lean on God when they see believers in their life who give up on God when they go through trials? That's Peter's point. We need to set an example of faithfulness to God. Your faithfulness to God matters. Say that to your neighbors. Your faithfulness to God matters. It matters. It matters. It matters because the world around us truly does watch us closely. How many of you figured that out? You say you're a Christian and all of a sudden, all, oh, they're honed in on you and they're watching you like a hawk. What's he going to say when this happens? Or what's she going to do when this happens? How's she going to react? They're watching you. And our faithfulness to God matters because we're setting an example. And if we don't remain faithful when we suffer, what's the message that we're sending to the unbeliever? What's the message? God isn't strong enough to save Remember Moses when he went into the desert and God said, I'm going to wipe these people out because they built this or made this golden calf. What did Moses say? What will the other nations of the world say that you weren't strong enough to save, that you brought them out into the desert only to destroy them? If we give up on God during trials, what's, what's it going to say about the faithfulness of God, the character of God to the unbeliever? It's going to say there's no point in serving God if, if they can't do it. And so when we go through painful trials, and we will, if we're a Christian, if we sin, if others sin, we'll go through difficult trials. If we go through all of those trials and we remain faithful to God, know that He'll turn everything for His good. And despite what we're experiencing, we continue to believe that God is good, that He's working for our good, and we don't give up on serving the Lord. We'll set a great example of faithfulness to God and perhaps give incentive for others who are watching, who are going through a painful trial or a fiery trial of their own, to go, I know what happened when Jim McNair went through a fiery trial and he stayed true to God and he got through it on the other side and he was blessed on the other side and maybe I should talk to him about how to get through this painful trial that I am going through because I've seen him go through it and, and succeed in life and etc. And etc. Cetera, et cetera. You hear what I'm saying? We have to set an example of faithfulness to God. So let's stand uh, this morning. Don't be surprised at the painful trial you were suffering as though something strange were happening to you. Cling to the goodness of God. Oh, we've got to take up an offering. Thanks, thanks Randy. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, the offering plates are on the back table. I can see them there. So you just place your offering in the, in the plate at the back. And then Merv, you and I will, or you and Jim, or um, Jim, you're going to have to leave for hockey banquet soon, aren't you? And, uh, well, we'll figure it out. Somehow we'll get it counted up, Merlin. Uh, we'll do that. So, um, well, let's turn to the Lord in prayer. If you're going through a painful trial right now, you're not going through something that's strange. It's just a part of life. Doesn't mean that God is angry with you or that you have done something wrong. Could just be that God has permitted this to, to come so that you can be overjoyed when His glory is revealed because glory is always coming. Glory is always in the future for a believer. Our painful trial is not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed. It will be revealed and we will experience the revelation of God's glory on earth as it is in heaven before we get to heaven. We will have times when we experience His glory and how more joyful will those times be if we remain faithful and true to the God that we serve in the midst of a fiery or a painful trial that we endure. The glory is that much sweeter after a painful trial. So just stick, stick with it. Commit yourself to your faithful Creator and continue to do what is good. So Father, in the name of Jesus... 
We thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are with us. Jesus, you promised uh, the disciples, and your promise is as true for us as it was for them. That you will be with us always, even to the very end of the age. And you are with us right now, and your presence has not forsaken us. And you said you would never leave or forsake us throughout your word, Lord. And sometimes when we go through painful trials, the very first thing that we question is, where is God? And what are you up to, God? And why aren't you in my life at this moment? But the reality is, Lord, you've never forsaken us. And I pray for those that might be going through a painful trial right now, whether in this room or whether listening online, that they would know, God, that you are good and that glory for them is coming. Glory for them is coming. Your glory will be revealed. And when it is, they will be overjoyed because of the painful trial. It, the response to your glory will be that much greater because they have been faithful and they have committed themselves to their faithful creator and continued to do good. I pray that you would give us all a willing spirit to sustain us that you would strengthen us by the Holy Spirit, and that when we go through painful trials, Lord, we, like Paul, would learn to rely on the strength that Jesus Christ provides to get us through any and every circumstance and any and every situation, that we can be content whatever the circumstances, because we know we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so, Lord, we just thank you this morning for what you are doing whether it is painful or whether it is glorious. And we thank you, Lord, that you are leading us from glory to glory, that we will experience your glory, and it will be sweet, and we will be overjoyed when it is revealed. In Jesus' name, and all of God's children said, amen. amen. Raise your hand for the blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and all of God's children said, Amen. Amen.